Our mission is to spread awareness of the message and divine beauty of the Quran across the world. Support our mission at www.bayina.org. That's B A Y Y I N A H dot O R G. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ إِنَّكُمْ ظَلَمْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ بِاتِّخَاذِكُمُ الْعِجْلَ فَتُوبُوا إِلَى بَارِئِكُمْ فَاقْتُلُوا فَاقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ عِندَ بَارِئِكُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى لَنْ نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى نَرَى اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّاعِقَةُ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَوْتِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد once again, everybody, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are a couple of important things that I wanted to mention before we move on with the ayat. Uh, in regards to the ayahs we've already studied, we saw, I, I walked you through the scene of Musa alayhi salam being called up to receive the revelation of Torah. That was for a period of 40 days uh, of fasting, and then Allah Azza wa Jal gave him the Torah. And through that, you notice that there's a deep connection between fasting and revelation. And that's actually upheld even in this religion of ours, in Islam, as finally revealed by Allah Azza wa Jal, the month is also the month of fasting. And that connection was there even at the time of Musa alayhi salam. As a matter of fact, a similar account is also mentioned in the New Testament of Isa alayhi salam, that when he received the Injil, he was actually also to do 30 days of fasting. So this account of 30, and as a matter of fact, Surah Al-A'raf will tell us that even Musa alayhi salam, was actually called for 30 days, and then he was asked to do an extra 10. That it was actually originally 30, and then he was asked to do another 10. And in Baqarah, which is revealed later on, Baqarah is Madani, Araf is Makki. So Allah is summarizing the account by calling it 40 days, Arba'ina Laylatan. So that's one thing I wanted to bring to your attention. The other is an important concept in the study of any surah of the Quran. Uh, just to make it easy for you guys to understand, I think you can use the term anchors. Anchors meaning Allah will use a word or a phrase that he already used in the surah. And he'll use it again in a completely different context. And by using it, he's reminding you of something he already said. So he's making a connection between what he said before to what he's saying later. Now you know speakers, or, or if you're listening to a long speech or something, you might notice that a speaker made reference to something 10 minutes ago, and then he kind of alluded to it 10 minutes later, and it becomes kind of like an inside joke. Like anybody who just walked in and heard him say it didn't laugh, but people who were listening to him from the beginning saw that he was calling on something that he brought to your minds earlier on, right? So that's kind of an anchor. You're using something you mentioned and echoing it one more time. You're dropping that anchor again. So what happens is we, we, we saw the story of Adam alayhi salam. And in the story of Adam alayhi salam, Allah says he gave him the words that he could make tawbah with. And we talked about what those words were. Rabbana zalamna. Anfusana, that we wronged ourselves. That's from Surah Al-A'raf. But the idea was mentioned that Allah gave him the words. And notice when we came to this story and they had wronged themselves, the same phrase, the different, you know, same exact verbiage, innakum zalamtum anfusakum. Rabbana zalamna anfusana, innakum zalamtum anfusakum. You've wronged yourselves. In other words, what he had to do was tawbah, what you have to do is also tawbah. It's actually a continuation of what was given to Adam alayhi salam. Then, فَتُوبُوا إِلَىٰ بَارِئِكُمْ And by the end, فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ And what did Allah say about Adam alayhi salam? فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Now what's he saying? فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ It's actually echoing the same exact phrase. Allah accepted his tawbah just like he was willing to accept yours. But you know the thing is, the, the, the mistake made by Adam alayhi salam is one in which cost, in a sense, it cost him Jannah, even though we explained that that's a test. But in a sense, now as a result of that mistake, he has to now, uh, you know, earn Jannah once again. And he's going to be put on trial on the earth. These guys, what mistake they made, they committed the act of shirk. And that which raises yet another question, why in the world did they worship a cow? Where did that come from even? Right, so we'll try to explore that question a little bit today also. But the fact that they made tawbah, 
for any crime, Allah Azza wa Jal will describe, even in this, in this Qur'an, Allah will describe that tawbah is enough. And this is a very important thing for Muslims to understand. Tawbah alone, you turning to Allah sincerely and apologizing and promising Him that to the best of your ability, as with no intention whatsoever on your part, you will never repeat that mistake again. You're ashamed of what you did, you're promising Allah you won't do it again to the best of your ability, and you're gonna like, you know, because I say best of your ability because it's possible you might make the mistake again. But you have no intention to. It's not in the back of your mind that, yeah, I'm probably going to do this again. Not like that. And you develop a hatred for what you did in the past. You don't glorify it or reminisce about the, the mistake you made. You don't look back at it and get a weird, you know, evil smile on your face or something. If you have that kind of tawbah, then those words are enough. There is no other additional penalty you have to pay. You know, for example, people confuse the idea of hudud with tawbah. There are certain crimes in Islam that are punishable, like theft or zina or murder. There are certain crimes that are punishable. Now some of those crimes, what if there are no witnesses? What if there, you weren't brought to trial? What if Allah covered that mistake for you? Or you, you, know, you did something wrong, like you did backbiting or you know, even let's take something serious like zina. Right? Somebody's committed zina. Zina is a very serious crime in this religion. It's not a small thing. But if there weren't four witnesses, then there is no physical punishment in this world. And you're not supposed to come forward and say, I would like to get punished for zina because I've done it and find your, you know, uh, confess to four people. As a matter of fact, a woman came to the Prophet admit she's done it. Away, go away. She wanted to confess and be punished, but he sent her away. Then she came back again and said, I'm actually, I'm pregnant. He said, don't come back until you have the baby. He kept sending her back. The point I'm trying to make is tawbah to Allah is acceptable if you just have sincere words before Him. He doesn't need to see you punished in this world before it's acceptable. You see, we have a concept of, you know, governments and judges and, you know, authorities that the only way you'll ever be forgiven for your crime is if you've done jail time or if you've paid a penalty. And unless you've paid a penalty, there's no way you're forgiven for your crime. You're still kind of a fugitive, you're still in trouble. Don't superimpose that on your concept of Allah. Allah is not like that. But then the, 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 the question that arises from that is then why, were, why wasn't the tawbah of Banu Israel enough? Why were they given such a harsh, kill your own tribes people? Why were they given that? That's the answer that's going to come in the text. And by the way, this is kind of a missing chapter in the history of the Israelites. Some of the rationale behind why Allah gave him such harsh punishment is not mentioned in the Torah. As a matter of fact, what is mentioned is pretty ruthless. Like, they actually, a lot of Jewish history, as you study it in the Hebrew Bible, is pretty shocking. Like them burning down entire cities, killing men, women, and children, and all kinds of stuff. By God's command. And this is, Quran avoids all of that. Like it doesn't actually attribute any of that to them. So actually, you might think that the Muslims or our sacred text, the Qur'an, is anti-Semitic or it's anti-Jewish. Or As a matter of fact, if you compare it with the Hebrew Bible, it defends their dignity more than the Hebrew Bible itself does. It actually saves them a lot of disgrace on many occasions. On many, many, many occasions. For example, in their account of the, uh, Jericho being conquered, the city of Jericho, where they crossed the water, even though historically it's implausible that it was Jericho, if, uh, you know, if you go with certain date lines. But anyway, what, you know, they were supposed to conquer the city of Jericho. And when they did, they had this concept of harem, which is like haram. It's a Hebrew term. And the idea was that they cannot take any anfal. You know what anfal are? Like the spoils of war? They can't take any of them. While they're in the wandering, they cannot have any spoils of war. So what they had to do was destroy everything. Which means the homes, the men, the women, the children, they couldn't even take prisoners. And so the biblical account is that they actually just engaged in massive killings of entire cities by God's command. We have nothing of the sort about them. We actually consider them innocent of a lot of those things. And actually, if you study carefully, according to what they've done with their book, it's not they that are being criminalized. It's not they that are being considered cruel or evil. You know who's being considered cruel? It's God Himself. It's actually an accusation against Allah Azza wa Jal, that Allah Azza wa Jal is bari from. Now, so that's the, that's the other thing I wanted to highlight in this, in this discussion. Now, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the idea of, uh, of the calf, where it came from. So I told you yesterday that the Israelites were made into, over time, because of the economic desperation, they became slaves. 
And they weren't the only ones turned into slaves. The Israelites are one of many ethnicities, all of them Semitic ethnicities, like the Canaanites from Canaan, in the Arabic term is Canaan, uh, were, were from the region also. They were also turned into slaves in Egypt of the Coptics, of the, of the pharaohs, okay? Now, for the, for the slave masters, they all look the same. So for them, it's not like these are Bani Israel and these are the, the Canaanites, these are the Semites. They called all of them Semites, you know? It's like they look at anybody, like, you know, some people, they look at any of us and say, hey, you guys are Asian, right? Like, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're like, you know, or people from a certain part of the world, you're Chinese, right? No, no, I'm Korean, I'm Japanese, I'm, no, you're Chinese. It's all the same, you know, like they, they, because you have this sense of supremacy, so you don't, you look at the races that you think of as inferior, and you just bunch all of them as one. But it works the other way too, all white people look the same to me, European, American, you know. I'm from Ohio, I'm from California, whatever. you're all the same. German, Polish, what's the difference? I don't understand. I still can't tell you from snow. So you know, like, <laughs> it's all good. So there's an oversimplification when it comes to stereotyping people, right? So the same kind of stereotyping happens from the master race to these slave races, the Canaanites and the Israelites. Now the, the Banu Israel were people who worshipped one God. I told you they maintained that belief somehow or the other. Over, over, overall, they maintained that belief. But the people of Canaan, the, the Canaanites, they, they were actually uh, worshippers of another god named El, E-L. That's how it's pronounced, El. And they said that the manifestation of that god is actually a calf. So in order to worship that god uh, and to pay homage to that god, they used to build these mini statues of baby cows, calves, with horns. Uh, and they used to do this all over their, their tradition. And these two ethnicities, they're still, they're the lowest class of Egyptian society, they're the servant class, they're intermingling, they're living together, they're mixing with each other. You know, for example, I'll tell you, Muslims in India, right? They, Muslims in India live side by side for centuries with who? With Hindus. And so, some Hindu practices, somehow or the other, made their way into Muslim practices. And some Muslim practices, in strange ways, have made their way into Hindu practices without it being a conscious thing. So a lot of, for example, in, in India, weddings, for example, and the kinds of clothing that we're dressed in, a lot of that has nothing to do with Islam, it has to do with Hindu tradition, but we've taken it on and it's just become part of the culture, right? So the rituals mixed with each other. I'll tell you a scary story. My neighbor, back in Queens, when I used to live in Queens, our neighbor was a Hindu lady. And she used to go to Atlantic City for Hijra every once a month. Atlantic City to, you know, to, to gamble, whatever. So that's what she used to do. And one day she was going there, and like her, her bag was open, and this frame, this picture frame, fell out of her bag. And I figured it might be like a picture of one of the gods or something. They take it for good luck. It was actually a framed Ayatul Kursi. And I said, why, why do you have that? Well, she goes, no, I, you know, this is, uh, this is for good luck. I take it every time I go to Atlantic City. <laughs> so... They're not that different from the Muslim liquor store owner who's got Ayatul Kursi on the cash register behind him, or, you know, <laughs> they learn something's good from us at least, you know? SubhanAllah. So rituals get mixed in with each other is the point, right? So the Israelites have now learned certain religious practices or certain rituals. Some of their lesser educated class has followed certain cult practices of the people of Canaan. Now that they've crossed the water, and Musa alayhi salam's supervision is not there, they go back to the same cultish practices. You know what that tells you? That they always had that in them, but they, were, they knew they'd get in trouble if they did it, if Musa is there. So as soon as Musa alayhi salam is gone, back to the old ways. Come on, this is how we always did things, remember? So those mixed practices came back in. This, you know, an interesting manifestation of the mixing of religions today, for example, is many parts of Guyanese society. The Guyanese were, a lot of them are immigrants mixed with the local, you know, lo local West Indian population. And a lot of them were brought in during wor World War II, right? Indians and, you know, people from different parts of the subcontinent, etc. Some of them Muslim, some of them Hindu, some of them Christian, all mixed in together over time. And so you have, uh, there you have people very confused about religion. Very, very confused. Alhamdulillah, there's a good strong Muslim population, but there's a huge population of Muslims who actually celebrate everything. Like they celebrate Christmas too, and they celebrate Eid also, and they celebrate Holi also, the Hindu hol hol holidays also. They, like they're just, it's all muddled together. I, I, I learned some strange things while I was in New York. In New York, when I was there, I used to watch, because Sundays is a time where you have nothing to do, so I used to watch Queen's Public Television. 
they have like this, like anybody could get on TV basically back in the day, right? So this guy, used to, Guyanese fellow, used to get on there and he had a program on Ramadan. Ramadan with Arsalan. And he would have nasheeds and singing and this and that. And, and then 20 minutes later, same dude is actually like Rama something and he's got a Hindu show. It's the same dude. He just put on a different hat and he's I'm like, Whoa, that is amazing. <laughs> So there can be a kind of religious schizophrenia that takes place. And that is, that is something that even happens today, but happened back in the day also. Like you may have seen a, a modern silly manifestation of it is you have people that are like driving their, there's some, some hippies that are driving their car, they've got like the crescent to represent Islam and the crucifix, and they've got like the Hindu symbols, and they've got the peace sign. And you know, they're just like, it's, it's all good, man. I love your truth, you love my truth, everything is truth. You know, like, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> So that's, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. You know, it's really fascinating. Some of these statues of the Canaanites, the calves, have survived to this day. They actually still exist, and you can find pictures of them. If you look up, uh, look up Canaanite bulls, or, or Canaan bulls, even Google Images, you'll find a bunch of pictures of these ancient statues that have survived from that time. But anyway, that was the inspiration behind this kind of thing. Now, why did they do this? This to them was a representation of God. Allah calls himself what in these ayat? The reason I brought this up, what does Allah call himself in these ayat? Fatubu ila bari'ikum. He didn't say fatubu ila rabbikum, fatubu ila Allah. Of the names of Allah, Allah chose which name? Bari. Like the name he mentions in Surah Al-Hashr also. Al-Khaliqu al-Bari al-Musawwir. Right? Al-Bari is one of the names of Allah. And its basic meaning is not too different from Al-Khaliq. It actually means very, something very similar to the Creator. So you find Al-Bari' huwa alladhi khalaq al-khalq la an mithal. That's the key part. La an mithal. And then bara Allahu an nasama wa khalaq as-samawati wal ard. Bariya or bara'a is actually a little bit different from khalaqa. Khalaqa means creating anything. Bara'a actually means to create something living. So bariya or bar, uh, you know bara'a comes when Allah creates something that is living, that has life. Now that's the first distinction about, because if Allah created a, a rock, you don't say bara'a al-hajar. You say khalaqa al-hajar. You understand? So that's the first difference. The second difference is that it's when Allah makes something with, and the idea is that there was nothing that He based it on. For example, when you build a new house, it's based on some idea of a house. Or when someone makes a painting, it's based on a picture they have in their head. It's, you, you build based on what's already there. Right? You don't start from absolute zero. Any creativity we have now is actually in some way or a form a compound of previously existing ideas. It's just this idea didn't connect to that idea. And when they do, we have creative thinking. But the idea of Bari is someone who created something with no pre-existing models. All human beings were created, but there was no pre-existing picture of what should this be based on? What should hands be based on? What should eyes be based on? This is entirely unique, unprecedented creation of Allah. Why is that name strategic and important in this ayah? By using that name, Musa alayhi salam is telling his people that you believe in a God who creates you with no sample beforehand. And yet you can turn around and make a sample for him. And you can turn around and create this thing that doesn't even have life. And you can worship through it a God that gave all of life, the one who is Bari. How can you create some, put something lifeless that violates the very essence of who he is in being Bari or Bari? You know, so Fatubu ila Bari ikum, thalikum khayrul lakum anda, you know, thalikum khayrul lakum anda Bari ikum. That's the phrasing that I wanted to highlight to you. Now, when he comes and makes this call to them, we already read what they had to do. They had to kill every one of their, their own people. And then Allah will accept their tawbah. What was their response? Yesterday I just told you they went ahead and did it. But they didn't just go ahead and do it. And this is the missing chapter from Jewish history. They didn't just go ahead and do it. What did they do instead? وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَىٰ لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكْ When you turned around and said, Musa, we're not going to accept what you're saying. When you put iman, nu'mina, with a lam, nu'mina laka, as opposed to nu'mina bika. We say, amantu billahi or amantu lillahi. Billahi, when you believe in Allah, that's a ba. When you add a lam instead of a ba, it actually means to accept what somebody is saying, to give in to somebody's demands. Lan nu'mina laka means we still believe in you, we're not going to accept what you're saying. We're not going to cave into your demands. Hatta narallaha jahratan. We're not going to listen to anything you have to say because what you are asking to, us to do is too insane to try to, to kill our own people. 
well, there's no way we're going to do that until we see Allah face to face to the point where we can hear Him. Jahratan actually, Zahiran. Face to face, obvious. So He can become visible to us. Annahu kana mujhiran. Ay sahiba jahrin wa raf'in li sawtihi. They say in Arabic that jahr also means not someone who's face to face alone, but whose voice you can hear yourself. It's like they're telling Musa alayhi salam, we want to see Allah and we'd like to hear Him ourselves. You get to go up to the mountain and talk to Him and hear Him. We'd like to go see Him and we'd like to go talk to Him ourselves. By the way, this sick question that they asked, it's rooted actually, this twisted idea is rooted in something beautiful. Musa alayhi salam, before all of this, had actually at one point told Allah, you know, because you know he spoke to Allah regularly. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَىٰ تَكْلِيمًا Quran says, Musa alayhi salam used to engage in conversation with Allah, and Allah used to engage in conversation with him regularly, initiated by Allah. So when this happened, one day Musa alayhi salam is, you know, and you're getting closer and closer to Allah, the more you are, you know, talking with him directly. So one day Musa alayhi salam finds the courage and he says, Rabbi arini, anbur ilayk. Master, show me. I just want to look at you. I just, want to, I just want to stare at you. He's been talking to him, min al hijab. He's talking to him behind a barrier through the bush, right? But he's not, he has never seen Allah. But the love of Allah intensified in him so much that he just can't bear this anymore and he just wants to see Allah. This is actually a desire of every believer also. You know? وُجُوهُمِ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ there's going to be, there are going to be faces on, day, on that day, on Judgment Day, that are lit up. They're going to be staring at their Master. We're going to be looking at Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal describes the people who He's angry with, لا ينظر إليهم He's not going to look at them. You know what that means? Bil Mukhalaf, it actually means that there are people who Allah will look at, and they will look at Him. They're going to be meeting with Allah. So, and, and then, then when we meet with Allah, then you understand, سَلَامٌ قَوْلًا مِنْ رَبِّ الرَّحِيمٌ That Allah Azza wa Jal Himself will say salam. A master who's you know, full of mercy. But Musa alayhi salam, his love of Allah intensified so much that he told uh, Allah azza wa jal in this conversation, Ya Allah, I just want to see you. Just show me. Just, I want to see you. And Allah of course told him, Lan tarani, you're not going to be able to see me. Now the Israelites know this story, but they say, you get to talk to him. If you're going to get, ask us to kill our people, excuse me, why don't you take us up to the mountain and we'll talk to him, we'll talk to him face to face and we can handle seeing him. You couldn't handle seeing him, we can't. We got this. This is what they told him. This, when they made this statement, they are not so different from Fir'aun. They're no longer that different than Fir'aun. Why not? He says, you know, أَطَّلِعُوا إِلَىٰ إِلَٰهِ مُوسَىٰ You know what? Why don't you, you know, build me a tower. Musa goes up on a mountain, and he has a fire on top of that mountain, and through that fire he speaks to his God, you know what, I don't need to go to his mountain, why don't you make me a tower taller than that mountain? He told his, his uh, you know, subordinate, Haman, why don't you build me this tower, and make it on fire, so that I can go up there, and I can, I can talk to Musa's God myself. If he's got a direct connection, I can make my own direct connection. This was his arrogance. You know, to not understand that the only people Allah speaks to are the messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam. To not understand the sacred nature of revelation. There are people to this day, you know their problem with religion? Why does God choose to speak to some people? Why can't He talk to me? I'm available, my phone is on. You know, there are people I've, like that I've spoken to. They say, why doesn't God just talk to me? Why, why does He have to go through people? Why do I listen, have to listen to this messenger? And this sickness was even manifest in them when an instruction came that was against their will, that wasn't going the way they wanted. And it was, it's not a small ask, by the way. Kill your own people is not a small ask. But the true nature of their lack of belief in Allah came out. And they said, we're not going to accept what you're saying until we see Allah face to face. By the way, there's an inherent psychology that became manifest in this statement. It came out. When they hear Musa, do they actually believe they're hearing the word of Allah? Or the instructions of Allah? No. They didn't say, we won't believe what Allah is saying. We won't accept what Allah is saying. We won't accept what you're saying. Like you're making it up. Why don't you prove it's from Allah? It's as though they're telling the Messenger والسلام, that they don't really believe he's a messenger. That they don't... And for, what position are these people in? To not believe in Musa السلام, as a messenger, the one who's delivered them from Fir'aun. The one in, with his staff, Allah parted the water. What position are they in to talk like this? But they did. They did. Now I told you beforehand, Tawbah is very easy. 
had Musa alayhi salam come down and said, you have to make tawbah, and they were immediate in making tawbah, maybe even the harsher punishments wouldn't have been revealed. But Allah Azza wa Jal knew that they are going to be, th be this way. By the way, Allah tests with harsh instructions sometimes, but He doesn't fulfill. What instruction did He give Ibrahim alayhi salam? Slaughter your child. But did it actually come to, come to pass? No. In Surah An-Nisa, He actually put us on the spot, Muslims on the spot. وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْ اِقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ أَوْ اِخْرُجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ Had we made the law over you people, that you have to kill your own people, or you have to leave your homes. What does that sound like? Which nation does that sound like? Kill your own, leave your homes. The Israelites. مَا فَعَلُهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ مِّنْهُمْ Most people wouldn't have done it. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ فَعَلُوا مَا يُعَدُونَ بِهِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ And had they done what they're being told to do, it would have been better for them. وَأَشَدُّ تَثْبِيتًا It would have been a, law, a, a more firm, more powerful, long-term, beneficial decision for them. Anyway, so they say, we're not going to see, we're not going to believe until we see Allah face to face. On this note, I want to tell you that this sickness did not leave them. And it shows up in the altered version of the Hebrew Bible that we don't believe in. We, we believe in the Torah when it matches with the Quran. When it says things that we just cannot accept because of our understanding of Tawheed, then you see how that's, that, that idea that they want to see Allah. They want to hear Allah themselves. They don't want to go through a messenger. It came back into their text in such dubious ways. What did, you remember what Allah sent over them, the ayat are coming. What Allah sent over them when they used to travel in the desert? Allah sent clouds over them. Al-Ghamam. You know how the Bible talks about these clouds? Allah Azza wa says, we, we sent a shading cloud over them. And I'll, I'll give you the linguistics of it a little bit later when we get to the word. But what, how did they describe it? By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them. This is the biblical account. Several, several verses of the Bible in which basically God was in the cloud. The God was in the cloud. And when they built the tabernacle, which is their portable qibla, their haram, which is the tabut that carried the staff of Musa and other things, they believed God was inside it. When they used to worship, like you know how children think Allah lives inside the Kaaba? That's okay when they're kids. <laughs> That's okay. We, we know that we, you, know, you can't help children understand the ghayb at a certain young age, so it's alright. And their imagination runs crazy a little bit. But as adults, you and I know, that that's a very inappropriate thing to say about Allah Azza wa Jal. But they even took that favor of Allah and they said actually it was God Himself in the cloud over us and he, we'd hear Him sometimes. And they make reference to this in their text, SubhanAllah. So this, this is, we, we, won't, we won't accept what you're saying until we see Allah face to face. What did Allah do with them? فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّاعِقَةُ فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّاعِقَةُ Then the loud explosive sound grabbed a hold of you. What is sa'iqa? Sa'iqa al-insan ghashiya alayhi wa dhahaba aqluhu When something overshadows the human being and he loses his mind, sawtun yasma'uhu kal haddat shadida When you hear some very loud explosive sound, that's actually called a sa'iqa. You know how they have sensory deprivation or like, like sensory torture, like really loud sounds and it drives you crazy and you start screaming and you don't look like you're in your right senses anymore? That's the kind of sound that overtook them. They were not willing to listen to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam. And you know, what I find even offensive here is they don't actually call Musa alayhi salam Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, Ya Ayyuhan Rasul, Ya Musa. This is how you talk to your Messenger. You know, Allah can call him Ya Musa, fine, that's Allah. But you're his Ummah, you're supposed to show some respect when you speak to your Messenger. At least call him Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, but nope. Calling him like he's just one of them. No respect whatsoever. And so, فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّاعِقَةً the, the loud explosive sound got a hold of them. There's actually one reference to this in Exodus. There's only a slight reference to this idea. And it's not even mentioned as an incident. Moses is basically told, I think it's Exodus 19.21. Uh, he's, he t uh, God tells him, make sure you tell the people not to break through and try to speak to God. Because they'll get killed. In other words, it seems as though they said, Ah, you get away, we'll go up the mountain and find out ourselves. That's the kind of attitude they, said, they had when they, when they said, Hatta narallaha jahratan. So they actually, it seems from the Bible, started to try to climb up the mountain of Tur as a, as a sarcastic response to Musa alayhi salam's instruction from Allah. And so Allah says, Allah sent a loud explosive sound, all of them died. 
all of them right then and there died and they saw it happen before their eyes وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ and you were st- standing there still staring as death was coming at you and it took you ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَوْتِكُمْ then we raised you even after you had been killed even after your deaths so Allah kills these defiant people this is all before they had to kill their own they spoke defiantly against Allah Allah gave them death right then and there then He raised them back from the death dead لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ so you may be grateful next time Hopefully you'll be grateful this time. So now we're learning the background of why was the punishment so intense? Why was tawbah so, so difficult for them? Because their defiance was no normal kind of defiance. And so Allah ta- moves the story then forward and starts talking to us about how, how their survival in the desert took place. They're in the Sinai region. And the Sinai region is a dry region. It's not entirely desert, but it is a pretty dry climate. And most of the vegetables that are available on the other side of the water, where they used to be in Egypt, and most of the foods and produce that's available there, is not available on this side. It's mostly dry rock and, 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 you know, and sand and very dry kinds of plants. Allah Azza wa says, وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامِ And we continuously cause shade over you with clouds. Ghamam is the plural, ghamama is the singular form, and it's actually a very interesting word for clouds. I'll share some things about that with you first. Allah provided them shade. We say in Arabic, وَغَيْمٌ مُغَمَّمْ كَثِيرُ الْمَا It's actually, uh, the word ghamam is a cloud that has a lot of water in it. Meaning it has the potential of rain. Sometimes clouds come and there's no rain. But clouds come that have a lot of rain in them, that's actually called a ghamam. Now why is that important? Because they're in the desert. So they're going to get rained on quite a bit. And of course, when it rains, what happens on the earth? Produce. They're, and they're going to need that produce. So it's important that Allah doesn't just say sahab, clouds. He says ghamam. But the word ghamam also comes from gham. And gham in Arabic is like karb. It's like sadness and depression. And, and you know why it's called that? Because aslul gham uh, is actually al-ghashi, something that overshadows you. Wasumiya ghamaman li'annahu yaghum sama ay yasturuha. It's actually called ghamam because it used to cover up the entire sky and provide them a shade. Like sadness overcomes a person, these clouds used to overcome them and then rain on them when necessary and follow them around. And Allah says, we continually provided shade to you. They were a traveling caravan and Allah Azza wa Jal kept that on them. The Bible will describe actually that wherever they went, it went ahead of them and their enemies when they tried to attack them, they would get scared of this cloud moving around with them. You know? And they'd get terrified. And it says that even they, they were even protected from the attacks of wild animals and other things. Because even animals and other creatures would get afraid of this cloud. This unusual cloud that followed them everywhere. Sometimes you may have seen in like intense weather, the clouds are not very high up, they're very low. You know? And the lower the cloud is, the better shade it can provide you. The cloud is high up, there's still a lot more room for the sun to come. Right? When the cloud is lower and lower and lower, and by the way, the lower they are, the more dangerous they are too. So they were threatening to others, but they were actually this umbrella that Allah Azza wa Jal provided to them. وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ وَالْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَى This is fascinating. Allah says, He sent down onto you. So the cloud is taking care of basic water supply, right, in the desert. And it's providing them shade from the heat. And these are lots and lots of people. The Bible exaggerates a little bit in the hundreds of thousands. That doesn't seem archaeologically or sociologically possible. I told you yesterday, they split out little by little, right? But anyway, this group that is with Musa alayhi salam now, Allah says, we sent down onto you two things. Al-manna was salwa. Did you know that the Hebrew Bible uses the word manna, calls it manna? And it was actually in Aramaic the word manna is found. And then it made, it made its way into, into Greek and from it even in Old English, manna. And it's used for a grain from Lower Egypt. Manna is actually a grain from Lower Egypt. In other words, Allah provided them something that was already kind of familiar to them. But manna, they, it's interesting, they first didn't recognize what it was. Let me tell you what it is. It's a kind of grain that grows on a... It's actually not inside the ground. Or not like kind of grass kind of vegetation. It's this... Um, it's this dry, like a uh, uh, plant with twigs, like you know, dried up twigs, and it looks like there's no leaves that are going to grow on it. And then insects come and they punch a hole in the branches, and then this honey-like thing comes out and it forms and crystallizes and it starts getting fuzzy looking. It starts looking white, like wool. This strange-looking plant that's actually called manna. It's still used today in many Arab cultures near the Delta. And even Jewish culture, they actually consider it a delicacy even to this day. And they still call it manna. 
they still call it manna. So the word is across languages. Of course, in the Arabic language, Allah chose the word for another reason. Allah could have said al-hab also, seed also. But Allah chose this word, subhanAllah, because the, in the Arabic language, it means another thing. In addition to meaning the food that they were going to eat, man in Arabic means a favor. Allah sent a favor down onto you. So there's izdiwaj al-dalala. There's actually two meanings here, both intended by Allah Azza wa Jal. But what's, what I find beautiful is that Allah says, He sent down manna. I understand salwa. Salwa is basically quail. It's a quail-like bird. And it's interesting that in the summer season, this region that they travel through, the, 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 to this day, quails migrate through that, through that region, through the Sinai region. That's actually a natural migration pattern for these birds to this day. So when Allah says He sent them down means, you know, when they migrate, they keep flying through. But the salwa would actually come and descend on the ground and you would easily be able to catch it. Try catching a pigeon, how, how easy is that? But they wouldn't fly. They would actually stay. So they, in their high season, they just come and descend and they were easily able to catch it and eat it. You know, uh, and this is a favor from Allah. Anzalna means we sent down, right? Like literally, He's forced landing these birds. He's forced landing these birds. But when I first studied this, I said, okay, I understand birds being sent down, anzalna. But how is the grain being sent down? The grain comes from the ground up. But then you, when you study this plant, you realize the grain never comes out until insects come down and punch a hole in the, in the plant, and then it's actually produced. And then it comes out. Subhanallah. Anzalna alaykum al manna was salwa. Everything came from the sky. The, the provision was coming from the sky. And if you look at it from a nutritional point of view, this manna was basically their carbs, their bread. They used to make bread with it. And then salwa was their proteins. So their essential nutrients are done. The only thing now they need is water, but basic water supply is coming from where? From the clouds. So they're, they're kind of taken care of. Now, here, here's the other really interesting thing about this. Uh, when Allah Azza wa sent them this food, وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّةِ وَالسَّلْوَى Allah said to them, كُلُوبٍ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ Eat from the many good and pure things of what we have, good and pure of what we have provided you. Eat from the good and pure of what we've provided you. Allah didn't provide them a lot of different things. All He provided them was what? Manna and salwa. And by the way, when they saw manna the first time, they didn't quite recognize it. Because this was in the more remote parts of Egypt. They were living in the main city center where they were doing the construction for the Pharaoh. So when they saw manna for the first time, they didn't know what it was. And that's why in the Hebrew language, the meaning of manna today, uh, or you know, thereafter in the biblical sense, manna means what is it? <laughs> the word manna actually means what is it? Like, like the first time they saw it, they're like, what is that? That's literally what the meaning of it became to them. But anyway, Allah says to them, provide, you know, eat from the good and pure things that we've provided you. Min tayyibati ma razaknakum. The word tayyib is important for the Muslims to understand. There's a difference between halal and tayyib. When two words that are similar in meaning, they come together, their meanings are actually distinguished from each other. Halal means that which has been opened up for you, you have the license to eat it, you're not in trouble if you eat it. That's halal. But Allah doesn't just want us to eat halal. If Allah only wanted us to eat halal, He would have said, you know, halalan. Done. But He says, halalan, tayyiban. Tayyib, tayyib actually means that which is good in and of itself. It produces goodness. It has goodness in it for you. It's inherently good and pure. This is actually the, the, the quality of food that you're supposed to eat. It should have good ingredients in it. You should eat fresh food, clean food. It should be tayyib. Just because it's halal, doesn't mean you eat, you know, like days old food and things like that. Or you eat things with nowadays like artificial ingredients and things. We should try to avoid those things because they're not tayyib. They may be halal, you know, but they may not be tayyib for you. Allah Azza wa describes to them what's been given to you is tayyibati ma razaqnakum, good and pure things of what we've provided you. Wa ma zalamuna, and we didn't wrong them at all. Walakin kanu anfusahum yaldimun. However, they used to continuously do wrong to themselves. Allah will leave that idea for now. He'll say, they, we didn't wrong them, they continuously did wrong to themselves. We're not going to learn what that wrong is until a few other chapters. He's going to skip the story and leave us wondering what wrong could they have done. But I will give you some idea. These people are wandering in the desert for 40 years. They're in the desert for 40 years as a people. And the only supply of food they have is what? Manna, salwa, and that rainwater. That's all they got. Okay? And later on they're going to ask for more water because they can't keep waiting for the rain. So they'll ask for more water and that will come. But you know, these two guys are sitting together going, Hey man, what's for breakfast? 
manna and salwa. What's, what's for lunch? Uh, salwa and manna. I decided to go crazy a little bit today, you know, like, what are they going to do? Salwa soup and, you know, manna sandwich, like, there's not much options. And these guys, you know, brothers, you probably understand this a lot better. We're sitting there eating the same food every day. You guys can't even go to the same restaurant for iftar two days in a row. You can't do it. If your wife puts out like chicken, you're like, we had chicken yesterday. Is this the same chicken from yesterday? <laughs> Is it that bad in the world, in, in our household, that we have to eat the chicken from yesterday? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. These guys are having manna and salwa for breakfast, manna and salwa for lunch, manna and salwa for dinner. And so every once in a while, these guys are sitting back going, man, remember back in the day, we used to go to Burger King. <laughs> we used to have like, ah, oh, ketchup. I miss ketchup, man. Mm. But what I, what I would do for some ketchup right now. So they, they would miss the food from back in the day. They missed the food from back in the day. But of course, they're in the desert. Now, let's put this in perspective. They're in the desert. And in the desert, there's no reason, no natural reason why a cloud should be following them around. So they should be constantly under what? The sun. And if they're constantly under the sun, it's a matter of a week or two, you're going to have mass deaths of children, of the sick, of the old, of women. You're going to have people dying left and right because of heat stroke, because of dehydration. On top of that, there's no regular food supply. So people are actually going to start star starving. Allah Azza wa Jal is keeping them alive in a situation where otherwise the only possibility is death. But even if Allah is helping you survive, over time you get a little bored. You know? And Allah says, then this boredom of theirs and their desire to get more led them to blasphemous behavior. And we'll get to that inshallah. Probably tomorrow we'll get to that. But today I want to tell you, why didn't they just go into some new town? I mean, there's lots of towns in the area. All of the towns were completely fortified. Massive, gigantic, military-style walls. Actually, Jericho in particular is described with... It's, it's amazing. It's like they had this like uh, uh, giant rocks as the first layer of wall. On top of the giant rocks, they had a 15-foot wall. Uh, behind that wall, they had a slope that was slippery that went about 30 feet high. So that if the enemies would try to, even if they got past the first wall, they'd have to climb up the slope. And if they're trying to get up the slope, they'd slip right back down. And as they're climbing up the slope, they are perfect target practice for all the archers and the spears and the people who pour boiling you know, tar and all this stuff over them. So they were kind of an impenetrable kind of defense. So they, even if they wanted to, they had no way of accessing any other cities. They weren't welcome anywhere else. And that's why yatihuna fil ard. They're going to wander around in the, in the land. They don't have anywhere to go. All these other cities are completely blockaded, pure, you know, fortified entirely. So now, we didn't wrong them, and they, they were only wronging themselves, but Allah did give them an opportunity. He took what He actually gave them the opportunity to enter one of the most fortified cities. Which one did I mention? Jericho. Now there is a timeline problem in biblical studies, but inshallah one day when we have time for that kind of tangent, we'll, we'll go into that more detail. وَإِذْ قُلْ نَدْخُلُوا هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ When we said to them, enter this town. Take it. Enter this town. فَكُلُوا مِنْهَا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمْ رَغَدًا And eat from it wherever you want, freely. Easy, just eat whatever you like. It seems to suggest almost as though the town is empty. As though nobody's there, right? And this actually coincides with an interesting period in that region's history. As empires were falling and there, there were a lot of ransackings and crimes happening, there were entire cities that got abandoned. And right before they were told to enter the city, before the abandonment of large exodus from cities, they were actually pretty well protected like I told you before. So when Musa السلام, asked them to go into the city before, they said, إِنَّ فِيهَا قَوْمًا جَبَّارُونَ يَا قَوْمًا جَبَّارِينَ There are some pretty tough people in there, we're not gonna go there. We can't go there. And that's when they were said, you know what, go wander in the desert for 40 years. But 40 years later, Allah opened the city for them. He opened it for them. And now Allah says, why don't you go and enter? فَكُلُوا مِنْهَا Now go eat in it. حَيْثُ شَيْتُمْ Whatever you want. رَغَدًا Freely. Now you get to eat what you've been wanting to eat all along. No more years of manna and salwa. Now that, that time is over. Now by the way, this is yet another anchor. Allah Azza wa said about Adam alayhi salam and Hawa salamun alayha فَكُلُوا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شَيْتُمَا 
And now the same words are being echoed. فَكُلُوا مِنْهَا حَيْثُ شَئْتُمْ رَغَدًا The only difference is رَغَدًا was before and رَغَدًا is after now. And what difference does it make from a language point of view? If it is مُقَدَّم, it is مُخْتَص which means, in, in simple English, when they were in Jannah, the care, رَغَدًا means carefree, openly, without worrying. That the, the lack of worry and the carefree nature of Jannah can never be compared to anything else. And so the word رَغَدًا does not belong in the same place when the word رَغَدًا is being used in dunya. So Ragadan goes at the end where it's not given special consideration like it was given in Jannah. So Fakulu, Minha, Haithu Shitum Ragadan, eat from wherever you like in this city. What Khulul Baabas would Jadan, there's one requirement I ask of you. Enter the doors of the city in a state of Sajda. And Sajda is also an echo. Echo of what? What was to, what was told to Iblis? Do Sajda. And why didn't he do Sajda? Out of arrogance, out of pride. And these people now, finally, they were so, you know, and their greed overwhelmed them, and they want to enter the city, and they don't want to enter the city in Sajdah. Now, how do you enter an ancient city in Sajdah? I want you to, those of you that play Assassin's Creed, <laughs> a lot of you, ancient gates of a city, right? The whole giant walls and their ancient gates of a city, and you have to go through those gates. Now, the thing is, when you go through those gates, how do you go into the gate in Sajdah? It's not like you put your head on the ground and kind of rub your way up forward. That's not the point. You go, you're, you're, you're riding a camel, you're riding a horse, you're riding a mule, and you put your, your, your head on the neck of the animal. And that's how you enter the gate in Sajda. So you're gonna, and if you don't have anything, then you just hold your hands like this, and you just kind of enter in a, enter in a state of humility into this place. Because this is a gift of Allah, and you're being humbled. This, you know, and, and so what we're learning here is when Allah gives you an unusual gift, your first response should be what? It's sajda. It should, you should fall in sajda before Allah and sajda. You know? So, what khulul baba sujadan? Enter the gate, you know, enter the city gate in a state of sajda. By the way, al bab is also important because that means that the city is for the taking. Because the most secure part of a city is what? The gate. The gate. Otherwise, you'd have to climb the walls to get in, right? But now the gate has been opened for them. So now the, the city is basically theirs for the taking. وَقُولُوا And as you enter in a state of sajda, say, حِطَّةٌ Say the word hitta. Hitta in Arabic, وَالْحَطُّ وَضْعُ الْأَحْمَالِ عَنِ الدَّوَابِ What a beautiful word. Hat actually means to remove the load off of an animal. Hatta actually means that there's a donkey or a camel, it's got a lot of stuff on it. As you're taking it off, hatatta. You took the load off of the camel. They're begging Allah, Ya Allah, take the load off of us. Ya Allah, the burden of surviving in the desert. Ya Allah, you know, and this, this exact word, the tafsir of this word, is in the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا Don't put a burden on us like you put on the people before us. As they say hitta, they're saying, Ya Allah, remove our burden, remove our burden, remove our burden. وَقُولُوا حِتَّى لِيَسْتَحِطُّوا بِذَلِكَ أَوْزَارَهُمْ فَتُحَطَّ عَنْهُمْ So that they may get the burdens on themselves removed, so that they may have an easier time. And that's what the deen of Allah is essentially. The purpose of the deen of Allah is not to put burden on you. The purpose of the deen of Allah is to remove the burden from you. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah intends to lighten your burden, literally, lighten your burden. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا That's what Allah Azza wa Jalla says. So here, when they say hitta, when you beg Allah to lighten your burden, then what will Allah do? نَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ خَطَايَاكُمْ We will cover for you all of your major, all of your mistakes. So many mistakes. From, we already saw so many. And there are so many in those 40 years that haven't been mentioned yet. But they're just called khatayakum, as if Allah did not even say sayyiatikum. Khataya is less than that, it's just mistakes. It is as though Allah will think less of your evils and just consider them mistakes, like sahu, like negligence, you know, it's okay. Allah is willing to do that if you can take this opportunity and think what we are learning now is that it's easy to turn to Allah in times of difficulty. But people forget about Allah when times become easy. And if someone can turn to Allah when times become good, when they turn in sajda to Allah, when all the doors of the world have been opened up, when the gifts have been opened up, and then you turn to Allah, that is the best position you're in to get the sins forgiven. People usually turn to Allah tadarru'an, out of humility, when times are very bad. When there's a sickness in the family, when there's a death in the family, when there's a loss of a job, when there's some kind of trial. 
But people forget about Allah when money is good, promotion is good, new car, new house, this, that. This is not the time to go into sajda and ask Allah to lighten your burden and to make sure you don't fall into fitna. You don't, you know, we, don't, we forget about Allah in those times. You know? And that's the time to remember Allah. And when people remind you of Allah in those times, you're like, man, come on, just let me just have some fun. Seriously. Right now you're going to give me a khutbah? It's not even Friday. You know? So you don't want to hear it at that time. Because you want to enjoy yourself too much. That's the time to remember Allah. And Allah says, and that by the way is not a small thing. To be able to remember Allah in good times is not an easy thing. You know? And so, it's only possible by people of the highest standard of Iman. And who are those people? The people of Ihsan. And that's why you see the ayah conclude, وَسَنَزِيدُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And we will increase those who excel. Because there's Muslimin, there's Mu'minin, and there is Muhsinin. People who can remember Allah in that state are Muhsinin. People who can remember Allah at the time of victory are Muhsinin. And this is, by the way, how Umar bin al-Khattab entered Jerusalem. On, on mule, on, in Sajdah. This is how the Muslims would enter Mecca. You know, just in humility before Allah Azza wa Jal. This, this is a certain mindset that victory, you know, at a time of victory is a time of pride. We won, yeah, we just got, we got them. And you're supposed to walk in howling and screaming and celebrating. But no, no, this is the time to be more humble than anything else. فَبَدَّلَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا Then those that had done wrong replaced قَوْلًا They replaced it with another word. غَيْرَ الَّذِي قِيلَ لَهُمْ Other than the one they were told. What word were they told? Simple one word. They weren't made to memorize a long dua. Say, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِلَّمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ They weren't made to memorize the dua that you guys make, you know, behind the imam after taraweeh, and you can't remember what he's saying because it's way too long, it's like 20 minutes long. They weren't told, read this. They were told how much? One hitta. Hitta. That's it. That's all you gotta say. And they couldn't do that. They started making fun of it. They're, they're on their animals. They're not going into sajda. And they replaced the word hitta with many say hinta. So hitta, hinta. And if you go ahead, would you say, no, no, I say hitta. What are you talking about? <laughs> hinta, hinta. Now what does hinta mean? Hinta means a fresh kind of grain. No more manna, man. We get hinta now. It's actually zar' wa nabat. We, we're going to get all kinds of vegetables in here. Oh, I'm going to have me a salad. And they said that inside the word hinta. That's all they were thinking about. The only thing on their mind was now the menu is about to go crazy. You know. So they فَبَدَّلَ الَّذِي ظَلَمْ فَبَدَّلَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا قَوْلًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي قِيلَ لَهُمْ فَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا رِجْزًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And we sent down from, on those who had done this kind of wrong, a, a, a severe punishment, which can also be call, called a marad a shadid you know, that, that you, you see, Allah uh, Sabiullah Bithal, they say this, it, it afflicts al-bashar, it afflicts the skin, wal jild. Like some say that when the punishment was given to them, their skin turned inside out, those who made fun of it. You know? And they just, they died of that punishment right there. بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ On account of the corruption they were carrying all along. All this time they were hiding their corruption. This is actually an echo from before. These people, their one word is not, they're, they're not being punished for that one word. Allah says, بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ Because of corruption they had been exhibiting for a long time. Just like Iblis. Iblis refused sajda how many times? Once. But he's not being punished for that once. Allah says, Kana min al kafirin. He used to be from the ungrateful. It was inside of him. The filth was inside. It just came out with that one instant. With these guys, by the way, it was just with that, that mockery of sajda with Iblis, and it's a mockery of sajda with them. So it's Allah's way of showing us that they followed the path of Iblis. Even though they were, you know, and this is by the way, not under Musa alayhi salam. This is important for you guys to know. As I, as I come to a close, or come close to a, a nearby a close. The, this is not under Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam had asked them to conquer the city and they said, no, there's people in there, we ain't going. We're not doing it. You go. فَذَهَبَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَ إِنَّهَا هُنَا قَاعِدٌ You go, and your Rabb go, you go both fight, we're gonna sit here, okay? And قَاعِدٌ means we're gonna sit here a long time. Don't worry, we'll still be here when you come back. They didn't even say جَالِسُونَ They said قَاعِدٌ Long term, buddy. I'm feeling tired. You know? And, but that's, that's why Allah Azza wa gave them the 40 years of wandering in the desert. They would have entered the city immediately. It was promised to them. The victory was promised to them. And what, what doubts could they have in the victory promised by Allah? They just escaped Fir'aun. They just saw water park. 
how would they have any doubt left? But they did. And that's why in the next generation, after these 40 years, under the leadership of Yusha ibn Nun, there's an entire generation of Israelites that has been raised in the desert. They've had their childhood meal and their adult food has been the same. And they're tougher because they were raised in this tough environment and they're tired of it. So when Yusha alayhi salam, Joshua who's called in the Bible, when he calls them for, to fight in the path of Allah or take the city, then they're actually much more willing. But even under him, unfortunately, they, as many of them exhibited the kind of nifaq, the kind of hypocrisy that mocked the religion. And so Allah takes us back now again. So you'll notice in the history of the Israelites as described in the Quran, Allah is going to go forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. This victory that I just talked to you about where they made fun, as they entered the city, this is actually after Musa salam died. He died in the, in the 40 years of wandering. He had already gone. And I, actually he was so tired of them. It's, I've, I've never seen words like this from a Prophet. Like Prophet والسلام, they would actually say, Najini, min al qawm al rescue me from wrongdoing people. Musa salam, doesn't need rescue from Bani Israel. He says, Fafruq bayni. Just, just like you parted the water and you separated us from the Hebrews, Ya Allah, part me from these people. Just cut me off. I don't want to deal with them anymore. These are, this is one of the last words of Musa alayhi salam about Banu Israel. Ya Allah, I want nothing to do with them. I want nothing to do with them. I, I'm done. I've had it. And it didn't come. Musa alayhi salam, for a man who had an incredible temper, we know about it, the incredible temper of Musa alayhi salam, right? When something bothers him, it really bothers him. And he can't hold it in. This is exhibited when he had that uh, when he saw the man being killed, and he just he couldn't take it. This is exhibited when he saw the girls, you know, getting water from the from the from the pond, and he couldn't take it. This is exhibited when he's traveling with Khidr in Surah Al-Kahf, and he sees injustices, he can't take it. And then that same man is going to stay with the Israelites for forty years, and how much he has to tolerate. Oh man. That man, for him to hold it in for that long, I, don't, I can't imagine what, what that what it must have been like. Because if Musa salam, just one day, just one day, he's like, you know what, I'm just going to, just one punch. Ya Allah, just one punch. Let me just let loose one time. You know what happens when Musa salam, punches someone, right? <laughs> and when they came so close to like, hulkifying him, when they came so, like when they got so bad that they just, the mockery of the religion got so out of hand, he was about to let loose. And he said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ I seek Allah's refuge, I might become from those who lose control over their emotions. Because <laughs> I can't, I, if I lose it, then these people are going to get it. Then he will become the sa'iqa. <laughs> you know, on them. So this man alayhi salam put up with a lot, but eventually even he just he couldn't deal with it. He just said, just separate me from these people. But now we're gonna go back before this parting happened. And we're gonna see them ask Musa alayhi salam for water. They're gonna beg Musa alayhi salam, this rainwater is not enough, Ghamam is not enough, we need to survive as a people, we need a water reservoir. All the main water supplies are taken up by those cities and all those cities are fortified. Where are we supposed to get water? Are we supposed to go back towards the waters of Egypt? And we're going to get captured again. We can't go back there. So what are we going to do? And so the ayat that are coming is when he made that request to them. And this is actually something mentioned in, uh, in the Bible. Interesting, I'll just tell you one cool thing about it. I know we're getting late. Just one cool thing about it. That region, the Sinai region, the mountains are still called Horeb or Sinai. Those are the two words that are used. The Hebrews also call it Qadesh, which is close to the Arabic word Quds for that region. They call it Qadesh. Qadesh Bar uh, Bar Barnia. I believe that's what they call it. That region, to this day, the rocks are very brittle. And to this day, there are incidents where if you just kind of hit a rock too hard, or the car crashes into a rock, water comes out. There's actually a feature of that region. And Allah did so, like it's a natural phenomenon there, but Allah enhanced the natural phenomenon and turned one strike into 12 springs of water for the 12 tribes of the Israelites. So we'll read, the, read about that inshallah ta'ala. Tomorrow, Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Our mission is to spread awareness of the message and divine beauty of the Qur'an across the world. Support our mission at www.bayina.org